Barry Morris Goldwater, January 2, 1909 May 29, 1998, was an American politician, businessman, and author who was a five term United States Senator from Arizona, 1953 65, 1969 87, and the Republican Party's nominee for President of the United States in the 1964 election. Despite losing the election by a landslide, Goldwater is the politician most often credited for sparking the resurgence of the American conservative political movement in the 1960s. He was a vocal opponent of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, believing it was an overreach of federal government. He also had a substantial impact on the libertarian movement. Goldwater rejected the legacy of the New Deal and fought through the conservative coalition against the New Deal coalition. He mobilized a large conservative constituency to win the hard-fought Republican primaries. Though raised an Episcopalian, he was the first candidate with ethnically Jewish heritage to be nominated for president by a major American party, his father was Jewish. Goldwater's conservative campaign platform ultimately failed to gain the support of the electorate and he lost the 1964 presidential election to incumbent Democrat Lyndon B. Johnson bringing down many conservative Republican office holders as well. Jeff Fischel says, the conservative faction of the party was on the defensive as a result of the magnitude of the election losses. Goldwater returned to the Senate in 1969, and specialized in defense policy, bringing to the table his experience as a senior officer in the Air Force Reserve. In 1974, as an elder statesman of the party, Goldwater successfully urged President Richard Nixon to resign when evidence of a cover-up in the Watergate scandal became overwhelming and impeachment was imminent. By the 1980s, the increasing influence of the Christian right on the Republican Party so conflicted with Goldwater's views that he became a vocal opponent of the religious right on issues such as abortion, gay rights, and the role of religion in public life. After narrowly winning re-election to the Senate in 1980, he chose not to run for a sixth term in 1986, and was succeeded by fellow Republican John McCain. A significant accomplishment in his career was the passage of the Goldwater-Nichols Act of 1986, which restructured the higher levels of the Pentagon by placing the chain of command from the President to the Secretary of Defense directly to the commanders of the Unified Combatant Commands. Personal Life Goldwater was born in Phoenix, in what was then the Arizona Territory, the son of Baron M. Goldwater and his wife, Hattie Josephine, Jojo, Williams. His father's family had founded Goldwater's, a leading upscale department store in Phoenix. Goldwater's paternal grandfather, Michelle Goldwasser, a Polish Jew, was born in 1821 in Poland whence he emigrated to London following the revolutions of 1848. Soon after arriving in London, he anglicized his name from Goldwasser to Goldwater. Michelle married Sarah Nathan, a member of a Jewish-English family, in the Great Synagogue of London. His father was Jewish and his mother, who was Episcopalian, came from a New England family that included the theologian Roger Williams of Rhode Island. Goldwater's parents were married in an Episcopal church in Phoenix, for his entire life, Goldwater was an Episcopalian, though on rare occasions he referred to himself as Jewish. While he did not often attend church, he stated that if a man acts in a religious way, an ethical way, then he's really a religious man and it doesn't have a lot to do with how often he gets inside a church. The family department store made the Goldwaters comfortably wealthy. Goldwater graduated from Stanton Military Academy, an elite private school in Virginia, and attended the University of Arizona for one year, where he joined the Sigma Chi fraternity. Barry had never been close to his father, but he took over the family business after Barron's death in 1930. He became a Republican, in a heavily Democratic state, promoted innovative business practices, and opposed the New Deal especially because it fostered labor unions. Goldwater came to know former President Herbert Hoover, 
whose conservative politics he admired greatly. Family In 1934, he married Margaret Peggy Johnson, wealthy daughter of a prominent industrialist from Muncie, Indiana. They had four children, Joanne, born January 1, 1936, Barry, born July 15, 1938, Michael, born March 15, 1940, and Peggy, born July 27, 1944. Goldwater became a widower in 1985, and in 1992 he married Susan Wexler, a nurse 32 years his junior. Goldwater's son Barry Goldwater Jr. served as a United States House of Representatives member from California from 1969 to 1983. Goldwater's uncle Morris Goldwater, 1852 to 1939, was an Arizona territorial and state legislator, mayor of Prescott, Arizona, and a businessman. Goldwater's grandson, Ty Ross, a former Zalai model, is openly gay and HIV positive, and the one who inspired the elder Goldwater to become an octogenarian proponent of gay civil rights. Military Career With the American entry into World War II, Goldwater received a reserve commission in the United States Army Air Forces. He became a pilot assigned to the Ferry Command a newly formed unit that flew aircraft and supplies to war zones worldwide. He spent most of the war flying between the U.S. and India, via the Azores and North Africa or South America, Nigeria, and Central Africa. He also flew the hump over the Himalayas to deliver supplies to the Republic of China. Following World War II, Goldwater was a leading proponent of creating the United States Air Force Academy and later served on the Academy's Board of Visitors. The Visitor Center at the Academy is now named in his honor. As a colonel he also founded the Arizona Air National Guard, and he would desegregate it two years before the rest of the U.S. military. Goldwater was instrumental in pushing the Pentagon to support desegregation of the armed services. Remaining in the Arizona Air National Guard and Air Force Reserve after the war, he eventually retired as a command pilot with the rank of Major General. By that time, he had flown 165 different types of aircraft. As an Air Force Reserve Major General, he continued piloting aircraft, to include the B-52 Strata Fortress, until late in his military career. He would remind those who called him rash of the old saying that there are no old, bold pilots interests. Goldwater ran track and cross country in high school, where he specialized in the 880-yard run. His parents strongly encouraged him to compete in these sports, to Goldwater's dismay. He often went by the nickname of Rolling Thunder. In 1940, Goldwater became one of the first people to run the Colorado River recreationally through Grand Canyon participating as an oarsman on Norman Neville's second commercial river trip. Goldwater joined them in Green River, Utah, and rowed his own boat down to Lake Mead. In 1970, the Arizona Historical Foundation published the daily journal Goldwater had maintained on the Grand Canyon journey, including his photographs in a 209-page volume titled Delightful Journey. In 1963, he joined the Arizona Society of the Sons of the American Revolution. He was also a lifetime member of the Veterans of Foreign Wars, the American Legion, and Sigma Chi Fraternity. He belonged to both the York Rite and Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, and was awarded the 33rd degree in the Scottish Rite. Political Career in a heavily Democratic state, Goldwater became a conservative Republican and a friend of Herbert Hoover. He was outspoken against New Deal liberalism, especially its close ties to labor unions he considered corrupt. A pilot, outdoorsman, and photographer, he crisscrossed Arizona and developed a deep interest in both the natural and the human history of the state. He entered Phoenix politics in 1949 when he was elected to the city council as part of a nonpartisan team of candidates pledged to clean up widespread prostitution and gambling. 
the team won every mayoral and council election for the next two decades. Goldwater rebuilt the weak Republican Party and was instrumental in electing Howard Pyle as governor in 1950. U.S. Senator As a Republican he won a seat in the U.S. Senate in 1952, when he upset veteran Democrat and Senate Majority Leader Ernest McFarland. He won largely by defeating McFarland in his native Maricopa County by 12,600 votes, almost double the overall margin of 6,725 votes. As a measure of how Democratic Arizona had been since joining the Union 40 years earlier, Goldwater was only the second Republican ever to represent Arizona in the Senate. He defeated McFarland again in 1958. With a strong showing in his first re-election, he was the first Arizona Republican to win a second term in the Senate. Goldwater's victory was all the more remarkable since it came in a year the Democrats gained 13 seats in the Senate. He gave up re-election for the Senate in 1964 in favor of his presidential campaign. During his Senate career, Goldwater was regarded as the grand old man of the Republican Party and one of the nation's most respected exponents of conservatism. Criticism of the Eisenhower Administration Goldwater was outspoken about the Eisenhower Administration, calling some of the policies of the Eisenhower Administration too liberal for a Republican president. Democrats delighted in pointing out that the junior senator was so headstrong that he had gone out his way to criticize the president of his own party. There was a Democratic majority in Congress for most of Eisenhower's career and Goldwater felt that President Dwight Eisenhower was compromising too much with Democrats in order to get legislation passed. Early on in his career as a senator for Arizona, he criticized the $71.8 billion budget that President Eisenhower sent to Congress, stating now, however, I am not so sure. A $71.8 billion budget not only shocks me, but it weakens my faith. Goldwater opposed Eisenhower's pick of Earl Warren for Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. The day that Eisenhower appointed Governor Earl Warren of California as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Goldwater did not hesitate to express his misgivings. Goldwater and the Eisenhower administration supported the integration of schools in the South, but Goldwater felt the states should choose how they wanted to integrate and should not be forced by the federal government. Goldwater criticized the use of federal troops. He accused the Eisenhower administration of violating the Constitution by assuming powers reserved by the states. While he agreed that under the law, every state should have integrated its schools, each state should integrate in its own way. There were high-ranking government officials following Goldwater's critical stance on the Eisenhower administration, even an army general. Fulbright's startling revelation that military personnel were being indoctrinated with the idea that the policies of the commander-in-chief were treasonous dovetailed with the return to the news of the strange case of General Edwin Walker. Republican Presidential Primary, 1964 In 1964, Goldwater fought and won a multi-candidate race for the Republican Party's presidential nomination. His main rival was New York Governor Nelson Rockefeller, whom he defeated by a narrow margin in the California primary. Eisenhower gave his support to Goldwater when he told reporters, I personally believe that Goldwater is not an extremist as some people have made him, but in any event we're all Republicans. His nomination was opposed by liberal Republicans, who thought Goldwater's demand for rollback, defeat of the Soviet Union, would foment a nuclear war. He delivered a captivating acceptance speech. Instead, he devoted more care to his acceptance speech than to any other speech in his political career. And with good reason, he would deliver it to the largest and most attentive audience of his life. No other statement of the 1950s and 1960s, including the conscience of a conservative, presents more truly Barry Goldwater's basic beliefs and his positions on current issues. U.S. Presidential Campaign, 1964 At the time of Goldwater's presidential candidacy, 
the Republican Party was split between its conservative wing, based in the West and South, and moderate-slash-liberal wing, sometimes called Rockefeller Republicans, based in the Northeast. He alarmed even some of his fellow partisans with his brand of staunch fiscal conservatism and militant anti-communism. He was viewed by many traditional Republicans as being too far on the right wing of the political spectrum to appeal to the mainstream majority necessary to win a national election. As a result, moderate Republicans recruited a series of opponents, including New York Governor Nelson Rockefeller, Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. of Massachusetts and Pennsylvania Governor William Scranton, to challenge him. Goldwater would defeat Rockefeller in the winner-take-all California primary and secure the nomination. He also had a solid backing from Southern Republicans. A young Birmingham lawyer, John Greenier, secured commitments from 271 of 279 Southern Convention delegates to back Goldwater. Greenier would serve as executive director of the national GOP during the Goldwater campaign the number two position to party chairman Dean Birch of Arizona. Journalist John Adams says, his acceptance speech was bold, reflecting his conservative views, but not irrational. Rather than shrinking from those critics who accuse him of extremism, Goldwater challenged them head-on in his acceptance speech at the 1964 Republican Convention. In his own words, I would remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. And let me remind you also that moderation in the pursuit of justice is no virtue. His paraphrase of Cicero was included at the suggestion of Harry V. Jaffa, though the speech was primarily written by Carl Hess. Because of President Johnson's popularity, Goldwater refrained from attacking the president directly. He did not mention Johnson by name at all in his convention speech. Former U.S. Senator Prescott Bush, a moderate Republican from Connecticut, was a friend of Goldwater and supported him in the general election campaign. Bush's son, George H.W. Bush, then running for the Senate from Texas against Democrat Ralph Yarbrough, was also a strong Goldwater supporter in both the nomination and general election campaigns. Future Chief Justice of the United States and fellow Arizonan William H. Rehnquist also first came to the attention of national Republicans through his work as a legal advisor to Goldwater's presidential campaign. Rehnquist had begun his law practice in 1953 in the firm of Denison Kitchell of Phoenix, Goldwater's national campaign manager and friend of nearly three decades. Goldwater was painted as a dangerous figure by the Johnson campaign which countered Goldwater's slogan in your heart, you know he's right with the lines in your guts, you know he's nuts, and in your heart, you know he might, that is, he might actually use nuclear weapons as opposed to using only deterrence. Johnson himself did not mention Goldwater in his own acceptance speech at the 1964 Democratic National Convention. Goldwater's provocative advocacy of aggressive tactics to prevent the spread of communism in Asia led to effective counterattacks from Lyndon B. Johnson and his supporters, who claimed that Goldwater's militancy would have dire consequences, possibly even nuclear war. In a May 1964 speech, Goldwater suggested that nuclear weapons should be treated more like conventional weapons and used in Vietnam specifically that they should have been used at Dien Bie Phu in 1954 to defoliate trees. Regarding Vietnam, Goldwater charged that Johnson's policy was devoid of goal, course, or purpose, leaving only sudden death in the jungles and the slow strangulation of freedom. Goldwater's rhetoric on nuclear war was viewed by many as quite uncompromising, a view buttressed by offhand comments such as, let's lob one into the men's room at the Kremlin. He also advocated that field commanders in Vietnam and Europe should be given the authority to use tactical nuclear weapons, which he called small conventional nuclear weapons, without presidential confirmation. Goldwater countered the Johnson attacks by criticizing the administration for its perceived ethical lapses, and stating in a commercial that we, as a nation, 
are not far from the kind of moral decay that has brought on the fall of other nations and people. I say it is time to put conscience back in government. And by good example, put it back in all walks of American life. Goldwater campaign commercials included statements of support by actor Raymond Massey and moderate Republican Senator Margaret Chase Smith. Before the 1964 election, Fact magazine, published by Ralph Ginsburg, ran a special issue titled The Unconscious of a Conservative, a special issue on the mind of Barry Goldwater. The two main articles contended that Goldwater was mentally unfit to be president. The magazine supported this claim with the results of a poll of board-certified psychiatrists. FACT had mailed questionnaires to 12,356 psychiatrists, receiving responses from 2,417, of whom 1,189 said Goldwater was mentally incapable of holding the office of president. Most of the other respondents declined to diagnose Goldwater because they had not clinically interviewed him, but claimed that, although not psychologically unfit to preside, Goldwater would be negligent and egregious in the role. After the election, Goldwater sued the publisher, the editor, and the magazine for libel in Goldwater v. Ginsburg. Although the jury awarded Goldwater only $1 in compensatory damages against all three defendants, it went on to award him punitive damages of $25,000 against Ginsburg and $50,000 against Fact Magazine, Inc. According to Warren Borison, then managing editor of Fact and now a financial columnist, the main biography of Goldwater in the magazine was written by David Barilon, the Israeli pianist. Political Advertising a Democratic campaign advertisement known as Daisy showed a young girl counting daisy petals, from 1 to 10. Immediately following this scene, a voiceover counted down from 10 to 1. The child's face was shown as a still photograph followed by images of nuclear explosions and mushroom clouds. The campaign advertisement ended with a plea to vote for Johnson, implying that Goldwater, though not mentioned by name, would provoke a nuclear war if elected. The advertisement, which featured only a few spoken words and relied on imagery for its emotional impact, was one of the most provocative in American political campaign history, and many analysts credit it as being the birth of the modern style of negative political ads on television. The ad aired only once and was immediately pulled, but it was then shown many times by local television stations. Goldwater did not have ties to the Ku Klux Klan, KKK, but was publicly endorsed by members of the organization. Lyndon Johnson exploited this association during the elections, but Goldwater barred the KKK from supporting him and denounced them. Past comments came back to haunt Goldwater throughout the campaign. He had once called the Eisenhower administration a dime store New Deal and the former president never fully forgave him. Eisenhower did, however, film a television commercial with Goldwater. Eisenhower qualified his voting for Goldwater in November by remarking that he had voted not specifically for Goldwater, but for the Republican Party. In December 1961, Goldwater had told a news conference that sometimes I think this country would be better off if we could just saw off the eastern seaboard and let it float out to sea. That comment boomeranged on him during the campaign in the form of a Johnson television commercial, as did remarks about making Social Security voluntary, and statements in Tennessee about selling the Tennessee Valley Authority, a large local New Deal employer. The Goldwater campaign spotlighted Ronald Reagan who appeared in a campaign ad. In turn, Reagan gave a stirring, nationally televised speech, A Time for Choosing, in support of Goldwater. The speech prompted Reagan to seek the California governorship in 1966 and jump-started his political career. Conservative activist Phyllis Schlafly, later well known for her fight against the Equal Rights Amendment, first became known for writing a pro-Goldwater book, a choice, not an echo, attacking the moderate Republican establishment. Results
Goldwater lost to President Lyndon Johnson by a landslide, pulling down the GOP, which lost many seats in both houses of Congress. Goldwater only won his home state of Arizona and five states in the Deep South, depicted in red. The southern states, traditionally Democratic up to that time, voted Republican primarily as a statement of opposition to the Civil Rights Act, which had been passed by Johnson and the Northern Democrats, as well as the majority of Republicans in Congress, earlier that year. In the end, Goldwater received 38% of the popular vote, and carried just six states, Arizona, with 51% of the popular vote, and the core states of the Deep South, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, and South Carolina. In carrying Georgia by a margin of 54-45%, Goldwater became the first Republican nominee to win the state. However, the overall result was the worst showing in terms of popular vote and electoral college vote for any post-World War II Republican. Indeed, he wouldn't have even carried his own state if not for a 20,000 vote margin in Maricopa County. In all, Johnson won an overwhelming 486 electoral votes, to Goldwater's 52. Goldwater, with his customary bluntness, remarked, we would have lost even if Abraham Lincoln had come back and campaigned with us. He maintained later in life that he would have won the election if the country had not been in a state of extended grief following the assassination of John F. Kennedy, and that it was simply not ready for a third president in just 14 months. Goldwater's poor showing pulled down many supporters. Of the 57 Republican congressmen who endorsed Goldwater before the convention, 20 were defeated for re-election, along with many promising young Republicans. On the other hand, the defeat of so many older politicians created openings for young conservatives to move up the ladder. While the loss of moderate Republicans was temporary they were back by 1966 Goldwater also permanently pulled many conservative Southerners and white ethnics out of the New Deal coalition. According to Steve Kornacki of Salon, in the South, Goldwater broke through and won five states the best showing in the region for a GOP candidate since Reconstruction. In Mississippi where Franklin D. Roosevelt had won nearly 100% of the vote 28 years earlier Goldwater claimed a staggering 87%. It has frequently been argued that Goldwater's strong performance in southern states previously regarded as democratic strongholds foreshadowed a larger shift in electoral trends in the coming decades that would make the South a Republican bastion, an end to the solid South first in presidential politics and eventually at the congressional and state levels, as well. Also, Goldwater's uncompromising promotion of freedom was the start of a continuing shift in American politics from liberalism to a conservative economic philosophy. Return to U.S. Senate Goldwater remained popular in Arizona, and in the 1968 Senate election he was elected, this time, to the seat of retiring Senator Carl Hayden. He was subsequently re-elected in 1974 and 1980. The 1974 election saw Goldwater easily re-elected over his Democratic opponent, Jonathan Marshall, the publisher of the Scottsdale Progress. His final campaign in 1980 was close, with Goldwater winning in a near draw against Democratic challenger Bill Schultz. Goldwater said later that the close result convinced him not to run again. Retirement Goldwater seriously considered retirement in 1980 before deciding to run for re-election. Peggy Goldwater reportedly hoped that her husband's Senate term, due to end in January 1981, would be his last. Goldwater decided to run, planning to make the term his last in the Senate. Goldwater faced a surprisingly tough battle for re-election. He was viewed by some as out of touch and vulnerable for several reasons, most importantly, because he had planned to retire in 1981, Goldwater had not visited many areas of Arizona outside of Phoenix and Tucson. He was also challenged by a formidable opponent, Bill Schultz, a former Republican turned Democrat and a wealthy real estate developer. 
Schultz was able to infuse massive amounts of money into the campaign from his own fortune. Arizona's changing population also hurt Goldwater. The state's population had soared, and a huge portion of the electorate had not lived in the state when Goldwater was previously elected, hence, many voters were less familiar with Goldwater's actual beliefs, and he was on the defensive for much of the campaign. Early returns on election night seemed to indicate that Schultz would win. The counting of votes continued through the night and into the next morning. At around daybreak, Goldwater learned that he had been re-elected thanks to absentee ballots, which were among the last to be counted. Goldwater's surprisingly close victory in 1980 came despite Reagan's 61% landslide over Jimmy Carter in Arizona. Republicans regained control of the Senate, putting Goldwater in the most powerful position he ever had in the Senate. Goldwater retired in 1987, serving as chair of the Senate Intelligence and Armed Services Committees in his final term. Despite his reputation as a firebrand in the 1960s, by the end of his career he was considered a stabilizing influence in the Senate, one of the most respected members of either major party. Though Goldwater remained staunchly anti-communist and hawkish on military issues, he was a key supporter of the fight for ratification of the Panama Canal Treaty in the 1970s, which would give control of the Canal Zone to the Republic of Panama. His most important legislative achievement may have been the Goldwater-Nichols Act, which reorganized the U.S. military's senior command structure. Policies Goldwater became most associated with labor union reform and anti-communism, he was an active supporter of the conservative coalition in Congress. His work on labor issues led to Congress passing major anti-corruption reforms in 1957, and an all-out campaign by the AFL-CIO to defeat his 1958 re-election bid. He voted against the censure of Senator Joseph McCarthy in 1954 but he never actually charged any individual with being a communist-slash-Soviet agent. Goldwater emphasized his strong opposition to the worldwide spread of communism in his 1960 book The Conscience of a Conservative. The book became an important reference text in conservative political circles. In 1964, Goldwater ran a conservative campaign that emphasized states' rights. Goldwater's 1964 campaign was a magnet for conservatives since he opposed interference by the federal government in state affairs. Although he had supported all previous federal civil rights legislation and had supported the original Senate version of the bill, Goldwater made the decision to oppose the Civil Rights Act of 1964. His stance was based on his view that the Article 2 and Article 7 of the Act interfered with the rights of private persons to do or not to do business with whomever they chose and believed that the private employment provisions of the Act would lead to racial quotas. In the segregated city of Phoenix in the 1950s, he had quietly supported civil rights for blacks, but would not let his name be used. All this appealed to white Southern Democrats and Goldwater was the first Republican to win the electoral votes of all of the Deep South states, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana, since Reconstruction, although Dwight Eisenhower did carry Louisiana in 1956. However, Goldwater's vote on the Civil Rights Act proved devastating to his campaign everywhere outside the South, besides Dixie, Goldwater won only in Arizona his home state, contributing to his landslide defeat in 1964. While Goldwater had been depicted by his opponents in the Republican primaries as a representative of a conservative philosophy that was extreme and alien, his voting records show that his positions were in harmony with those of his fellow Republicans in the Congress. What distinguished him from his predecessors was, according to Hans J. Morgenthau, his firmness of principle and determination, which did not allow him to be content with mere rhetoric. Goldwater fought in 1971 to stop U.S. funding of the United Nations after the People's Republic of China was admitted to the organization. He said, I suggested on the floor of the Senate today that we stop all funds for the United Nations. Now, 
what that'll do to the United Nations, I don't know. I have a hunch it would cause them to fold up, which would make me very happy at this particular point. I think if this happens, they can well move their headquarters to Peking or Moscow and get M out of this country. Political Relationships Goldwater was grief-stricken by the assassination of Kennedy and was greatly disappointed that his opponent in 1964 would not be Kennedy but instead his vice president, former Senate Majority Leader Lyndon B. Johnson of Texas. Goldwater disliked Johnson, saying he Please subscribe and thanks for watching.